Welcome. This is Megan Mitchell with Agents of Change Social Work Test Prep. And today I'm here to bring you our fourth segment in our ASWB practice questions. If you're interested in learning more about our study platform or our study materials, you can check us out at agentsofchangeprep.com. So what do you need to know about practice questions? Here's a few tips that we su suggest when you're working through practice questions. You got to complete the practice questions. Completing practice questions is just as important as studying content. You need to get your reps in with the practice questions. You need to have a strategy to break them down. You need to be able to know what the question is asking you. You want to read each question two times through. Why is this? Because you don't want to miss out on any details the first read through. So the second time through, you really get to go a little bit deeper and see if you missed anything and pick up on anything that you missed at first glance. If you're someone that rushes, I definitely suggest that you maybe write on your whiteboard or use a mental reminder that you need to slow down and read things through and read things through thoroughly. When you are reading a practice question, ask yourself, what is this question asking? If you don't know what the question's asking, you're probably not going to be able to answer it. So this can sometimes be tricky. Sometimes you might say, I have no idea what this question is asking. If that's the case, you want to go into your toolbox. You want to make sure that you are able to break down what the question is giving you in terms of context clues so that you have a better handle on what the question is asking. If you're someone that rushes, you want to read through all answer choices before selecting an answer. You don't want to say, I know it's B and move on to the next one. Every single answer choice is important and you want to make sure that you're going through all of the answer choices using process of elimination to be able to answer the question to the best of your ability. So you really got to slow down, you got to think, and you want to make sure that you are using those critical thinking skills to make the best informed choice possible. So let's go ahead and jump into our first question. Practice question number one. A social work supervisor meets with a supervisee who shares that they are sexually attracted to a client they have been treating for several months. What should the social work supervisor do first? A, discuss the need to co-treat the client while the supervisee works through this dilemma. B, process with the supervisee their feelings of attraction towards the client. C, help the social worker to end the therapeutic relationship with the client. D, discuss the need to report the supervisee to their state board for a boundary violation. Go ahead and read this one or take a pause and read it. This would be an ethics question. So you want to be thinking ethically, what do you do? You are the supervisor, your supervisee is feeling some sort of sexual attraction to a client and they've been treating this client for several months. What should the social work supervisor do first? Remember, we have to have a starting point before we work through other things. Okay, let's start eliminating. You always want to do process of elimination. It's going to help you out. It's going to improve your chances of getting it right. You want to eliminate anything too extreme. D is definitely too extreme at this point. Discuss the need to report the supervisee to their state board for a boundary violation. We're not to the stage that there's any boundary violation that needs to be reported yet. This supervisee has just stated a sexual attraction. We don't have enough information that they would need to be reported, right? And you need to think of what the supervisor is there to do. They're there to process things. They're there to give guidance, support. So D is out. It is too extreme. Um, C is also too extreme at this point. Help the social worker to end the therapeutic relationship with the client. It might be appropriate, but we need to do some assessing of what is going on first. Is this sexual attraction causing the supervisee to not be able to do their job to the best of their ability? Is it causing a problem? Is it a block for the therapeutic relationship? So C is out, D is out, which leads us to A or B. A is not appropriate at this time either. Discuss the need to co-treat the client with the supervisee while the supervisee works through this dilemma. Imagine what that would do for the client. If all of a sudden the supervisor comes in, it's kind of throwing off some red flags to the client, right? And it's just not appropriate to do to the client. That's making this issue the client's problem and not the clinician's problem. So process of elimination, our best choice is B. 
we first need to process with the supervisee their feelings of attraction towards the client, better understand what's going on. Is this just a physical attraction? Is this going to the point where the, the supervisee is having sexual urges? Does the supervisee want to act on these? There's so many things that could come along with sexual attraction, and it's important for the supervisor to hold a space that is safe and the supervisee can process these feelings to determine next steps. These other answer choices might be appropriate at a later time, right? Working to end the therapeutic relationship. We don't know if that's appropriate yet. And we hope that it does not get to the point that the supervisor would need to report the supervisee to the board. So B is the correct answer for that one because this is a first question. Okay, practice question number two. A young man comes to see a social worker because he feels lost and would like the social worker to help him with his problems. In order to best assist the client, the social worker should A, ask the client what he would like to see changed in his life, B, give the client some suggestions for addressing his problems, C, refer the client for an evaluation for depression, D, praise the client for coming to seek help. Go ahead and take a moment to read this one or pause the video if you are answering this question. Okay, client comes to you feeling lost. How do we help with his problems? And remember here, this question is asking how do we best assist the client? So let's go ahead and use process of elimination. Ruling out the most extreme answer would be ruling out C. Refer the client for an evaluation for depression, we have no knowledge yet that that's necessary. Um, feeling lost does not necessarily translate to depression and referring out is not appropriate at this time. Um, so C is too extreme, we're ruling that out. I would also rule out D, praise the client for coming to seek help. That is a great step. We do want to make sure that we validate the client in that step to taking them to come in, but that's not going to assist them with the problem of feeling lost and wanting help with this situation. So C is out, D is out, we're down to A and B. Remember, we always wanna be client-centered. We don't ever want to have a power dynamic or a power differential. So we would rule out B, give the client some suggestions for addressing his problems. We would, the best answer here, meeting the client where they're at, working from a strengths-based approach, empowering the client, ask the client what he would like to see changed in his life, right? We need more information, right? This, the client's the one who knows the client best. So we would want to first see what he'd like to see change. That gives us something to work from. And then we can use that to co conceptualize what we're going to do moving forward with this client. So the correct answer is A, ask the client what he would like to see changed in his life, gives the client the autonomy, it, it helps um, build rapport, and it's not creating any sort of power dynamic or us giving suggestions, right? We want to work in conjunction with the client. Question number three. This is another ethics question. A social worker may limit a client's self-determination when the client's actions, A, pose a serious and imminent risk to self or others according to the social worker's judgment, B, cause significant disruption or risk to the therapeutic process, C, result in legal actions such as arrests, fines, or civil penalties. D, violate agency procedures and policies as established by the head of the agency. Go ahead and read these ones. This one can be tricky for some people. When can we limit the right to self-determination? Okay, let's start eliminating here. We are going to rule out D, violates agency procedures and policies as established by the head of the agency. It doesn't matter what the agency's policies are. What matters is that we're respecting the client's right to self-determination um, and we're following the code of ethics. And there's some agency procedures and policies that actually don't protect the client, so that would not be appropriate in certain cases. So D is out, right? Doesn't matter. We need to still re respect their rights. Rights are rights. C is also out, result in legal action such as arrest, fines, or civil penalties. 
We serve clients that have arrests, fines, or are facing charges due to civil penalties. We would not turn them away just because of this or limit their right to self-determination. That's not appropriate. Um, if there is court mandated work, that's different, um, but that would come from a judge and we would be working from a different lens if that were the case. So now we're to A, do we limit self-determination if it poses a serious and imminent risk to self or others? using the social worker's judgment or when it causes significant disruption or risk to the therapeutic process. It's not good if there's a disruption or risk to the therapeutic process, but we do still respect the right to self-determination, right? Um, there's many times that we still need to uphold confidentiality and that could damage the therapeutic relationship. However, self-determination still needs to be honored. The time when we would limit self-determination is if we feel clinically that the client is a serious or imminent risk to self or others. This might include homicidal ideations, suicidal ideations, plan to harm. Um, in those cases, we'd have intent to warn and we'd have to go through the proper channels that way. So A is the appropriate answer. We can break confidentiality, we can limit their self-determination if we feel they're a risk to self or others. And that might be we need to put an involuntary hold. We might need to call 911. Um, there's a variety of different things, but we always want to do our best to respect the right to self-determination. Even if you think um, hospitalization is necessary, you hope that you would get to a point where you can work with the client that they would voluntarily go. But um, we do need to do risk planning and consider level of risk when establishing that. If you are looking for more study content, we have everything you need at agentsofchangeprep.com. We have blog posts, we have videos, we have self-care tips. Also follow us on social media and make sure you subscribe to our channel if you want to get updates when we post new videos because we do post those quite often. Um, if you have any questions and you're looking to contact us, our contact info is here, agentsofchangeprep at gmail.com. And lastly, of course, thank you for tuning in. I hope that you find this content helpful. And remember, you got this and you can do it.